So the first one was our perception. Our perception, how we perceive things. And that was our view. This is the old word they'd say view. We say it's our perception. How do we see? How do we see the world? The next one we say, and we're using another word over here. We're saying harmonious. And this is where you're going to hear a difference. Harmonious, they used to say right view. This is either you had right view or wrong view. I mean, we change it a little bit and say it's harmonious perception. It blends with life or it doesn't. So we have harmonious perception. Next one, this one used to be thought, right thought. And we're going to say imaging. And this is the image you hold in your mind, image, imaging, harmonious imaging or images. Can you read that? I hope you can read that. Next, we're going to say communication. This one used to be speech. But what Bonte likes to talk about with this, and I do too, is that when you're communicating as a mother, if I come outside, I have many, many ways I can communicate with you without speech. Hmm. I can go, hmm, <laughs> with a certain tone, and you're going to come in for dinner, you know, or if I come out and, and the three of you are playing outside, and I've asked you three times to come in for dinner, I can just put my arm on my, on my hip like this, and my body language tells you, you better come inside for dinner now. <laughs> so there's different ways that we can do things with our eyes, our body, and have a form of speech, and this is harmonious communication. Next one is movement. Now this is movement. Okay, movement. We're talking about the movement of mind's attention. Where is it when you're practicing? Your mind's attention. Okay, mind doesn't move around, but the attention moves around. So harmonious movement of mind's attention. And this one used to be actions. Okay, now this is not, there's nothing wrong with saying right view, right speech, right uh, thought, right actions when you're teaching a community in uh, that way. But when you're talking about specifically about meditation, you have to refine how you're teaching the path. So it's applying precisely to uh, what, how you do your practice. Okay, movement of mind's attention. This one is lifestyle. And lifestyle is like a little bit more specific than your livelihood. It used to be right livelihood and wrong livelihood. Doesn't want to write. Okay, livelihood. And we're not saying there's anything wrong with that, but we want you to concentrate on setting up a lifestyle, even if you're in a one room apartment and no place else to set up a lifestyle so that you have space for yourself to develop where there's a quiet place you can go if you have a family. This could even mean sitting on a bench outside with a particular scarf on your head and nobody bothers you. And it's your private space. It's making sure you have private space where you can, um, you, you know, pay offering at your altar, respect to the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, but also when you're meditating, you have a spot where you can be where no one will bother you. That's kind of how this applies. Your lifestyle. Now these three down here are critical. These are really critical here, okay? Because the last, these three that are down here, this one is called practice. This one was observation, harmonious observation, and this one we say is collectedness. Now, why are these so important? This is what I'm going to show you, how the language is a little bit different. And it's like, sort of like going to a, another level because 
when we're working with Vipassana, we're concerned with the feeling in our whole entire body inside and out. That's what people tell me most of their experiences. But now what we're going to look at, we're going to go to the control center for the body and the mind, and that's the mind. So we're going up here, and that's it. We're not concerned with feeling so much talking about sensations and feelings inside and out of the body and such. But I will tell you one thing. If you've been doing Vipassana, straight Vipassana, when you come and switch to work, attempting to learn to do the Brahma Viharas with this approach, when you do that, the people who have done the Vipassana before make a lot of uh, success moving down the path pretty quickly. And the reason is because they've had good training in instructions, in discipline, and they, uh, they know that if they, if they follow things precisely, they're able to do that. And also they can pick up on sensations because they were looking at the whole body with sensations. Now we go to where we're concerned here. Now we're asking you, we teach you how craving actually works and what is the definition for craving and when we talk about that there is a symptom and the symptom they can pick it up faster than anybody else and if they learn the steps of the practice properly which i'm going to show you here and that's what's here right here the observation this one is you, we say it is what mindfulness is. And we decided to simply say to you that mindfulness is a form, it's a specialized observation skill. That's what it is. Collectedness, just the same way. There's nothing wrong with concentration. But if I tell you to please use concentration, there is too many things in this day and time where we have to use this kind of very pointed kind of concentration to accomplish something um, when we're we're doing things in life and the kind of concentration we're talking about is just gently collecting the mind together and leaving an open space like this for me to watch through and i have a whole range of vision this way out like this way inside when i close my eyes to watch inside but if i pinch and i try to only for instance, follow the breath as an object and concentrate too much on an object, then I won't be able to develop my path. Because if we're concentrating on the object, that's another lesson in itself. What is the purpose of an object? What is an object? Why do you have an object in meditation? To understand that, why you have one, is really important because that object has no information for you whatsoever about becoming awake or going through and enlightening yourself by opening the mind. It doesn't have anything to do with it. It's actually as useful as an anchor is to a sailboat. So if you have a sailboat and you're, you, put, you take the boat, okay, and your boat is parked, you want to put the rope down and have an anchor so the boat doesn't float away. That's the purpose of the anchor on the boat, okay? But this anchor doesn't help this boat sail. It has nothing to do with it, okay? It's only so that the boat doesn't float away. So when you are watching inside, you don't want to float away and start paying attention to something else. You also don't what if you do if you are naturally pulled away you want to be able to have a place to come back to and this is your home base this is the place that is your home base okay so this takes you back to where you started when you have an anchor so the purpose of an object in a meditation actually if we were to explain it like in a test or something the purpose of the object is to have a returning point if you're pulled away and you're not observing what's happening anymore, you need a place to come back to and continue watching to see what's gonna happen next. So this right here is the most important one that is in this group. These guys, these are very important here, the way they work, but the practice steps are absolutely 
urgent that you have them right. And this is this used to just be called right effort. And that's what it is. It's right effort. What is right effort? It is a practice. An actual practice. And it has four steps in it. And this is what Siddhartha figured out. He figured out if you did this, you could go all the way to Nibbana. <laughs> and reaching Nibbana is like reaching a, a jhana. You reach a jhana by having the right conditions arise. When the conditions arise, you don't make anything happen. You step back and allow the conditions to arise so you can fall into the next level in the case of all those levels on the path. Now watch this. The first one is to recognize unwholesome mind states. An unwholesome mind state is a mind state that causes you to use craving. The craving comes up. I like it, I don't like it. Mind. I want it, you start going after it, and you're not on your object of meditation. Or you don't like what is happening, you want to make it stop. These are both unwholesome. And I like the word imperfection, that's used in several suttas when we're talking about the hindrances. Recognize the unwholesome mind state. Release the unwholesome mind state. Release the unwholesome mind state. What does it mean? Let your attention, let go of your attention off of that whatever it was that came up in your mind. Just, It's just like I have this pen and I wanna know how to release it. I just let go and it falls. That's all the release step is. But when you do this, uh, we when you do do it, you have to add a little step here and relax your head right afterwards. So whenever you let go of something, then you relax your head and then you smile and come back. So I'll show you this in a minute. Re recognize the unwholesome mind state, release the unwholesome. The next one, these, this is from the text, is basically bring up wholesome. So the whole entire journey on Siddhartha is so exper his whole entire experiment was actually looking at unwholesome mind states and wholesome mind states and attempting to see what would happen if I l lived in the wholesome, not, not a good deal. <laughs> what happens if I live where there's wholesome mind states? Very good deal. Everything works well. As long as I keep my precepts, there becomes this balance. Yeah, that's there. So bring up the wholesome states. And the fourth one is keep wholesome going and produce, produce more more states, more wholesome, more states like that. We'll just say states like that, that feel like that. Those are the good ones. And the, and the place where you really need to help yourself bring up an immediate, immediately, when you're in trouble, when you get angry, when you're upset about something, where, where, whenever it is, first you just go, <laughs> I just got caught. And then you say, I can bring up a wholesome, you bring up a smile. That's what you have to bring up. You have to bring up a smile. What's the deal about the smile is this. There is a muscle that runs from here. If you smile with your, you smile with your cheekbones up like this, you can feel the muscle when you go like that, like this, you can feel it right here is the top of the muscle and it runs down to the corners of your mouth. And that's what pulls the smile to come up. And so people are not smiling normally. If they start smiling, then that muscle gets gets really nice and toned. So for ladies, I always say, do this, you know, and you won't be looking very old when you're older because you have this 
this tightness in your face where you are practicing this, you know, with smiling. It's a great, great thing to, as a side note, you know, keeping wholesome going produce more states. So when I look at how we're practicing TWIM, when we're practicing tranquil wisdom insight meditation, you just saw these four steps, okay? Now watch, here's TWIM. The recognize is the same. Recognize that your, 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 your attention has moved or you're pulled away from your breath or your metta when you're practicing, okay? And then you recognize it, then you released it. You let it go, you released it. So you let go and then we say, relax the head. That's where this one comes in and there is a reason for it and it's in the instructions for the Anapanasati Sutta and people have missed it for many, 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 many years to forget to tell you to tranquilize the bodily formation and tranquilize the mental formation. They taught you tranquilize the bodily formation. The problem was a lot of people in this day and time, this is where the body stops up top. From here down is the body. This is the head. <laughs> this is very funny. Okay. But the head is part of the body, isn't it? And if you relax the head, what happens if you relax the head is the body and mind have a uh, conjoined bit of work. And if I have a high blood pressure and I sit quietly and just do some breathing and I think about a lower blood pressure, my blood pressure goes down. And that's down here, isn't it? My blood pressure is down here, but I thought about it up here. And so there is a mind-body connection and this is what the Buddha found. So you recognize, release, relax, smile as you come back smile and return. So we say smile, re-smile as you return. So you need to smile because when you do this, act this activate this muscle, it's hooked to the brain and the brain relaxes slightly. These two lobes in the brain, they separate slightly and the pituitary gland starts producing some endorphins. The pituitary is located in the middle part of the brain. So what I'm saying is you see that the way this is working to recognize, to release, and to relax, okay, and then to re-smile is the bringing up the immediate wholesome, the fastest wholesome you can bring up is to smile. And that's what we found happen when you put equipment on somebody, the reaction is the same as if they thought of something nice, but if the other ones just smiled, got the same thing, the same effect. Okay, re-smile. And then you return, you return uh, and you repeat, you keep going with the wholesome. So this is in perfect alignment. These are the steps of right effort. And so that's basically what we're practicing. We're practicing right effort. So going back again to the Four Noble Truths, which we went in that direction, Siddhartha, how detailed was he about that? And so I'm going to go into a little bit here. I wondered if he really did explain what sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair was. We saw it all over the suttas. And we saw this is what they were working toward letting go. Well, what was that? Did he actually tell us? And then finally, they pointed to 140. And you go to 141 right next to it. And when you get to 141, you have the exposition of the truths. And in that section, he tells you what everything is. And he says, we want to know what friends is sorrow, what friends is lamentation, what friends is grief, what friends is despair, what friends um, is causing the suffering. And he's giving you a paragraph on each of those. And that is 141 is the Satya Vibhanga Sutta. So you go peek at that and look very carefully how detailed this was and how he was detailed. The only thing, that I don't, you know, I, I like everything that's going on in the sutta. It just doesn't give away one thing. 
It doesn't give away, uh, it, the sutta is laid out for a human being from birth to death and going through another lifetime. And it makes it sound like it's only pertaining that way. We have to be very careful <laughs> when we have 86,000 suttas, okay? 84,000 were the Buddha's suttas and, and 2,000 of them belonged to the other arhats, okay? Now, if you're gonna tell me everything that happened in Buddhism in one sutta, Buddha couldn't do that. <laughs> He couldn't do it. So this is what happened in a way to Satipatthana being claimed as it had all these four different titles over 20 years. I tracked the title of what they were writing about for Satipatthana Sutta. Satipatthana Sutta. Satipatthana Sutta, the way to Nibbana. A way to Nibbana. A way to Nibbana. Satipatthana Sutta, the only way to Nibbana. And then you run into the monk I talked to you about in the beginning, where the only thing that matters was the Satipatthana Sutta. And that piqued my curiosity. <laughs> Wait a second, how many suttas were there? Could it, is it possible if we took Satipatthana Sutta that we could learn everything we need to know about Buddhism in our practice? No, absolutely not. It's not possible. There's too many topics in there that I know that you don't know that will cause you to trip up as you go along because you didn't get those other topics. So it's, it's, this is why we're sort of living in a dangerous time for Buddhism. And that means that when we are going to learn a Buddhist Buddhism as a main major in a university, and we find out that a lot of times people are only exposed to four suttas, the Anapanasati Sutta, okay, for the breathing meditation, and Satipatthana Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya, number 10, and Mahasatipatthana Sutta, which is more detailed of Satipatthana in the Digha Nikaya, and then the Parinibbana Sutta. How many suttas did I say that he taught? <laughs> And then four suttas, and that's all that they, and this is, um, sometimes it's a monk's education and the total amount education. That's like, I'm wondering what happened. Why weren't they interested in the suttas? Well, somebody said, somebody wrote something and he said what he said. <laughs> that's how it works. So when they have this big commentary where the person that actually didn't write it, but he condensed together 125 commentaries into one book. And his name, I didn't even realize for, I'm gonna tell you the truth, I didn't realize for almost five years that Buddha Gosa actually meant the voice of the Buddha. When I heard that it meant the voice of the Buddha, then I began to understand the problem because when that went, when Buddhism went to the United States, everybody took this book, we don't have to go in the suttas because this this voice is saying what he meant. You see what he meant, except he didn't when it came to the meditation. He didn't. <laughs> it's a fact. And they've been using this as if it was the Holy Bible and what Jesus said directly and it's absolute, but it isn't. And that's the problem. Because now if we have a bunch of people around the world who are saying we can practice meditation, but can we actually get to any of those attainments anymore? No, there's story, one story says the brains are different. The brains are not different, by the way, I checked. <laughs> the brains are not different, okay? And then the conditions are wrong in the society and they, all kinds of stories about why, but nobody wants to go back and question things anymore. And if we don't question, here's how it works. If we don't keep questioning things, then we don't get knowledge. And if we don't get knowledge and we have to come around again, we come back stupid. Now you think I'm being harsh when I say that? Okay, I'll show you where it is because I found it. It's in Sutta number 135. I'm betting it's on section 18, but I'm gonna go see if I'm right. I might be wrong. <laughs> 135. Um, hmm. Wait a sec here. Here you go. 
I was right. It was pretty close to that one. Okay. So here, here a student or some man or woman, they go to visit the recluse or the Brahmin, the teacher, and they ask, Venerable Sir, what is wholesome? What is unwholesome? What is blamable? What is blameless? What should be cultivated and what should not be cultivated? What kind of action will lead to my harm and suffering for a long time? What kind of action will lead to my welfare and happiness for a long time? Because of performing and undertaking these actions, he reappears in a state, if he uh, re reappears in, again in another human state, wherever he is born, um, he is, he comes back uh, stupid. If he, this is if he doesn't, if he does not visit the recluse and he does not ask those things, he comes back stupid. And that's in section 17 of the uh, Chula Kama Vibhanga Sutta. And I thought, this is he, is he really serious about this? And you know, then the next part is saying the same thing with all those questions. And if you do pay respect to the recluse and you do go and you do ask all those questions and you test it for yourself and you decide whether this works or not for you, because whatever I'm telling you, you shouldn't be taking, she said this and it's this way. Uh -uh, I'm a guide. This is what I know how to do point. And if you fall off track, I'm really good at figuring out what you did wrong and how to get back on track again. That's what I am. That's what my teacher is. The Buddha was the actual teacher in our school. We say that directly. He was the teacher. So these lessons that come from the suttas when we teach you are the ones he taught his monks directly. And we take the ones out of this book that are directly have to do with meditation. So out of 152 suttas in this book, you want to understand where I come from. Where does the Mataji come from? Well, 152 suttas in this book, we virtually swallow this book, okay? 76 of the suttas, they can affect the way you do your meditation. This has all been examined over the years. 22 of the 76 of those we have been using as direct resource as we teach the retreats. So you hear a lot of similar things, but we've been tying together eight subjects, eight tiny topics. And if we can weave them together and get you to see the interrelationship of them, then you have really good comprehension of the Dhamma while you are learning the meditation. You see? Well, why is that so important, Sister Kama? What's that? Why is that so important? Why do you need good comprehension? Well, because of the modes of progress. Okay, what are the modes of progress, Sister Kama? I've never heard of the modes of progress. Well, the Buddha was kind of cool as a teacher, and he left this map for the monks that is called the modes of progress. It has four modes. So if you are practicing a painful meditation when you're practicing and you have slow comprehension of the Dhamma, that's poor progress. If you are practicing and you have painful meditation, but you have quick, clear comprehension of the Dhamma, that is still poor progress because you're sitting in a painful way. If you have comfort, if you're practicing in a pleasant meditation, which is obviously the opposite of painful, and you have slow comprehension of the Dhamma, that one is poor progress. So the only one that's excellent is learning how to sit in a comfortable position so you don't have to move at all, okay? You learn how to do that so you're sitting in a pleasant meditation and you have quick, clear comprehension of the Dhamma. What Dhamma, Sister Kama? That's what we're gonna talk about next week. What Dhamma? So I'm coming at this from a different angle than I did before in the beginning, but there are reasons for this. If anybody heard the old set of, of the, um, the foundation series when I first wrote it, it's a long time ago, May, that I wrote that. I looked and I saw it's like almost back in 2005. And then we, we did some work on it the last time. I think it was a year and a half ago or something, or two years back, we did go through this whole thing. Now going through this again, I'm seeing what people are having problems with now. And I want that to be in the front to framework 
you need to understand what were those topics that he taught those those like eight topics that can be taught to a person in 10 days and in 10 days time they can get into experiencing the jhanas and understand the structure of the path and understand how to move down that and see clearly and understand what's happening how am i having this experience how does a human being operate? How do I suffer? How can I stop suffering? So that's where we're gonna go a little bit deeper next time is, is this, these eight pieces. And we will come across these words along the way and we will funnel them into a glossary system. And it's might, gonna be a little bit different than the first version because we're going to have these things in the front because if a lot of the students come, you know, that are practicing now, you want to know the answers, you know? Why am I running out of energy? What's happening here? What do I do when this happens, when that happens? These things you want to know about, and you want to know what he was teaching, that it was easy to understand, immediately effective, inviting me to have deeper and deeper inspection, and it was untouched by time. That's the last piece of that. Sandatiko statement. It was untouched by time. That means that whatever it is, if we do it the right way, that's a big if. If we understand it the way they understood it, and then it'll work. It's simple. 